Today I'm in Murphy's and I'm joined by Nick Breeding and we're going to look at cask ale production. Um, it's not something, Nick, that would be commonly uh, available in Ireland, but we are increasingly getting requests from brewers um, that are showing interest in it. Uh, some are quite passionate about it. Have you any tips that you would give to breweries that haven't approached cask ale production and sort of steering them through that process, what they should be doing in their everyday practice? Yes, of course. I think uh, it's really heartening to hear that there is an interest in some of the brewing quarters of producing cask beer because it's a lovely beer, done, done right. It's it, probably one of the best beers you can actually enjoy in the marketplace for the, for the consumer. So the best place to start is again with the four basic raw materials, water, barley malt, a good yeast and hops and a little bit of research will indicate that probably a well-modified pale ale malt is where, you, is, is where you would start from. Yeah. Uh, traditional English hops, not too hoppy, although you can experiment down the line with a more, uh, more, more of these citrusy styles. Your water needs to be uh, nice and soft and uh, suitable for uh, brewing a cask ale, which is a bit of a sort of burtonization. So there's a bit of a sulfate to chloride ratio of two to one, and that's where we can help you design a water profile for, 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 for producing a, a nice cask ale. Yeah. Um, and your yeast needs to be a classic sort of top ale yeast. It might even be a dual strain. Many of the famous brands that are produced in the UK are dual strain yeasts, that, uh, which the, there are two strains of yeast, maybe one flocculent and one not flocculent, but there'll be different styles which lends the, uh, dip, the, the final product its character. And um, so those probably the best place to start is with your raw materials. Um, simple process, yeah. single infusion mashing, uh, four roller mill, nicely gently crushed malt, and uh, and then a, a, a single striking temperature of between 63 and 65 degrees C, uh, saccharification for around about an hour, uh, sparging around about 72 to 75 degrees C, and then a good boil with your hops, and, uh, and then a nice uh, f sort of start of fermentation temperature would be around about 18 degrees, between 17 and 18 degrees, allowing a gentle rise to 22, 23, Primary fermentation should be finished in three to four days, and then a bit of uh, maturation, cooling down to around about 10, eight to 10 degrees C. Okay. How long would you hold the maturation for then? Another four or five days, or? Uh, probably, yes, about that. About four to five days. Three to five days would be a typical time. So if you brewed your beer on a Monday, by the following Monday, it would be already chilling down, and then you would try and rack it into casks that week, so uh, start of brewing to going into cask, typically an eight to 10 day process. Okay. So it's very fresh. Yeah. The, the intention is cask beer is very fresh. And of course, the great trick is that with cask beer production, to be proper cask conditioned beer, it needs to have a little bit of time in the cask, either at the brewery or on the way to the, brewery, on the, way to the pub or and in the pub cellar. So okay. this introduces an element of outside the brewery's control work where you need to have a good landlord who understands cask beer and allows it to do its job in the cellar of his pub before he puts it on dispense yeah. on a hand pool. So packaging into the cask, putting your wort or well beer at that stage obviously, so your beer into the cask, there's secondary fermentation needs to take place. Do you recommend adding yeast or sugar or do you what, what's the best approach for them? It, it, um, yes, it, 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 uh, traditionally priming sugars would have been used because the beer would be fermented out to around about uh, gravity, final gravity of 10.6 to 10.8 in the brewery. So there's not a lot of residual sugar left for any secondary conditioning. So brewers would prime their casks at around about uh, one to two pints of uh, primings per barrel. That would be in the old currency, 36 gallons of uh, priming sugar, uh, just a syrup solution made from uh, ordinary white granulated sugar dissolved in water, yeah. so to make a thin syrup. Mm -hmm. And that would be enough just to give the yeast, uh, the residual yeast of which there would be a low count, around about half a million cells per mil in the cask. That would be enough to give the condition required because the carbonation is quite low in cask 
unlike in keg and can. But products. that adds to the mouthfeel and the drinkability. It, it, you need a little bit of uh, condition because it, exactly, it adds to the mouthfeel, a little bit of CO2 helps to promote the flavour, it lifts some of the hop character. Those casks would commonly also have been dry hopped, but at a very low level, not the sort of levels that we see in these modern yeah. hop forward beers, but a, a, a gentle aroma. So that the idea is you get a balanced product of bitterness, sweetness, um, maltiness and hoppiness yeah. and of course the, the, with a little bit of alcohol there as well. So uh, it, there'd be a bit of a dry finish on the palate but there would also be a sweet mellow flavour in, in, in yeah. the mouthfeel. In terms of uh, getting the clarity for Cascail, so if we're putting uh, beer in at 8 to 10 degrees and we're adding a su sugar solution it's going to kick off fermentation again, there's a need for other products in there. That's you quite know. right, that's a good point, it's a very good point and this is the, where, the role of finings, traditional beer finings and there are essentially two types of finings at the, on the cold beer side. There's the, what we call an auxiliary finings which is usually uh, a silica or a polysaccharide um, material which is added to clear out the protein because as the beer cools down at the end of fermentation protein begins to come out of solution and it can form a haze so uh, the brewer will add, add these auxiliary findings to clarify the protein and then once that's taken place he'll add a, a, fine, a, a yeast findings agent traditionally icing glass but there are now also versions of a silica based findings which will clarify the yeast because once the yeast has done its job we want it to settle out in the cask, at the, in the belly of the cask which is why they are shaped as they are and stored in the cellar on their side and then you'll have a very bright product indeed, really bright product so it'd be as bright as it had been gone through a filter yeah. but uh, this is very bright and sparkling, it shows off the colour of the beer, the little bit of sparkle and uh, is very pleasant then to, to drink. Yeah, we enjoyed some nice cask last night. Um, we did. I, I, really, I find the drinkability of it really, really delicious. Um, one thing that I noticed was the clarity was you know, really, really good. So if you're a new brewer and you're venturing into producing a cask ale, your recommendation would be to add auxiliary findings and isinglass? Yes, okay. yes, I think so. The, uh, the, the, the amount of protein in, in beer always varies and this is determined by the quality of the malting barley and possibly some of the adjuncts that might also be used because often most cask beers are 100% malt but many brewers add maybe uh, a little bit of wheat or a little bit of invert syrup or some other coloured malts to give colour, character and flavour to the beer. So the, the, the ratio of these materials added and their actual quality will determine the amount of protein that's there. Now protein of course is important because it adds mouthfeel, it adds flavour it adds yeast food and it's, a, and it's required for a nice foam on yeah. the beer as we saw last night we were talking about the, the cling and the on lacing the glass, yeah, on yeah. the glass and the foam which is a, a pleasing aspect to, 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 to look at. So, uh, but an excess of protein is a problem uh, and in, it normally manifests itself in the form of a haze and okay there is a style these days for, for hazy products and that's what it is generally is a, is a protein haze but in the traditional proper cask conditioned beer it shouldn't have a haze and this protein is removed by the addition of auxiliary findings and then once that's cleared out of the system adding an icing glass or a silica based uh, yeast findings will uh, then cause the yeast to flocculate out and then you get a very bright product indeed. I remember years ago um, talking to a very um, well respected brewer uh, and this was overseas in, in one of my former <laughs> life, lives and they had done a huge research into the market of what consumers naturally gravitate towards in a bar if they're not certain of what they're going to drink and it was demonstrated over a huge database and sampling size that uh, people move to a bright sparkling product rather than a hazy uh, dull product and so th that was one of the reasons why uh, you know, subconsciously we are drawn to brighter, uh, clear, uh, sparkling looking uh, food rather, or drinks rather than, um, rather than hazy ones, yeah. hazy ones, so. See, my limited experience with it, I, I just, uh, I love the product, um, but I would like to see more brewers using it in Ireland and I think we've um, de-skilled the pub trade a little bit and that needs to be reintroduced. 
but from a brewery perspective, once they have added their um, sugar solution and their findings, does that need to stay in a warm room or a warm place to get the secondary fermentation to take place? <coughs> like the same way, you know, bottle conditioning does, yes, or is it different? Yes, yes, it's a good point. I think um, generally the ambient temperature and the, and the yeasts have adapted themselves to be able to, although I mentioned a warm fermentation, a primary fermentation, say between 18 and 23, 24 degrees C, uh, around the, the sort of cask serving temperature is, is, is usually recommended between 10 and 14 degrees C, uh, 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit in the old currency. Yeah. Uh, but that, the, the yeast will still work, but just at a slower rate. And that's more desirable because you don't want it to be working as strongly as you do in the brewery because it will blow the shives and the, uh, the keystones out of the cask. You just want a nice gentle uh, conditioning, which uh, will the, the yeast will do, and of course the yeast count is a lot lower as well in the car, so it, it won't run away with you. But it just gives enough of that, lifts enough of that um, CO2 to give a little sparkle and a tingle. So when the landlord receives it, he will um, soft what we call soft peg the cask. There's a, there's a shive in the top of the cask, and this is all part of the sort of management of cask beer in in the pub. There's this uh, language in what we call the cask furniture, which is all the bits and pieces you need around the cask to deliver it correctly. The shive has a, is, is the large cork-like um, bung in the top of the cask, and there's a little hole in the middle of it. And it, when it's uh, filled at the brewery, this hole is like sort of almost drilled out, but not quite. And when it gets to the landlord in the pub cellar, he will knock out that little, we call it a tut, and, and pop that into the beer and then immediately put a soft cane, a porous peg in. And this allows the conditioning, excess condition, which will, the yeast will create, just to work off through the porous peg. And then after a day or up to the experience of the landlord and the style of the beer, whichever cask he's got, he will then remove that porous peg and put in a hard peg and, and seal it. So any further conditioning starts to raise the pressure in that the CO2 is dissolved in the beer rather than lost to the atmosphere in the cellar. Yeah. And that creates the sparkle. What is the time frame usually from um, starting the dispense to, you know, what's the shelf life on it? Yeah. Is it three days, five days? The shelf life is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a good question. It's short, generally, because of course it's an unfiltered, unpasteurized product. Uh, so it's a live product, it has yeast in there. And of course, as you draw beer out and serve it, so the volume in the cask is replaced by uh, usually air. To try and prolong shelf life, uh, some landlords um, breathe in CO2 or, 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 or a mixed gas on top to try and uh, act as a blanket to protect air getting to it because of course air oxidizes it and it will change the flavour. Mm -hmm. um, so typically a cask before it's tapped may have four, five, even six weeks of shelf life if it's a strong, you know, the presence of alcohol and hops has a, back, it has a sort of preservative effect. But once a cask is tapped, it really needs to be consumed within sort of two or three days. Okay, that little, yeah. So, so, so it's quite, so hence the movement, as, as volumes in pubs have dropped in terms of uh, consumption, so the unit of currency has reduced from a 36 gallon barrel, which is what I was, when I uh, did my brewing, was around then. Now it's a nine gallon or 72 litres little cask called a, a firkin. And that's really the unit of currency of, of, of now. And that's because you can probably sell a couple of firkins over a weekend, yeah. which is what ideal. If you had a barrel, you'd probably be left with half of it for the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and when, yeah. when the pattern of our consumption now has, has changed and so that beer would probably go off yeah. or at least it would deteriorate to the point where people wouldn't really want to drink it and they like the freshness of, the, uh, of, the, of a freshly tapped cask. So it's a short shelf life product. Before we finish, where do you stand on the sparkler, no sparkler debate? Ah, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've experienced both and of course I now live in the north of England and sparkler is uh, absolutely required. It's a little device on the end of the swan neck of the, pub, uh, of the, of the uh, tap which uh, creates a very fine jet and causes lots and lots of bubbles and a creaming of the, of the beer and a nice thick head which is what they like in, in Yorkshire and, yeah. uh, and the north 
of England. In the south, I've seen it poured flat and it looks like tea yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or cider. There's no foam at all. And, uh, and then, of course, the people up north say, well, you're not getting a right pint, are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a tremendous debate going on. But, but you see, brewers like, say, a, a classic brewer in the southeast of England, Shepherd Neem, um, Harvey's of Lewis, they produce the most wonderful beers and they don't use sparklets on, on the outlets of the tap and, and it's still a really, really nice drink. Yeah. So I can take you to all corners of the UK and show you some of the styles and the differences and we would be here until doomsday trying to, to decide which is the best one that we've had. Yeah. So uh, I, I think for me at the moment, I would say sparklet because yeah. it livens a beer. It creates a, an, 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 an extra interest with its foam with the uh, tingle you get from a, 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 the, the, the CO2 balanced by the creaminess and the mellowness of the, of, of, of the water and the, the malt that's been used. So yeah. that's where probably I am at the moment. That's only because I lived up there for such a long time now. Yeah. I, would, uh, I would go for that. I know it's a, a point of contention <laughs> with some people, so let us know in the comments, sparkler or no sparkler. But um, Nick, that was really helpful. Thanks so much. Good.